Oh, you should talk. <laughs> oh, whoops. I actually have to put the thing back up on the screen. Now. Okay. So far, so good. So you, you can see. It's just, they, they might see me like squinting in the thing, and then they will be like, I need to get sunglasses so I can be in the picture and that can blind. Yeah, that will work. I know some professors. I'm not going to mention their names because it's going on YouTube. But all right. So, any questions on the first speech that she gave? Did it make sense? Do you guys feel better about it now that we've gone through it? Yes. Try some of this stuff. I'm serious. It actually works. I mean, there's some people again. They're just not going to integrate with you. But half the time, more than half the time, I feel like it works. So, so the giving of orders. What are our principles of giving of orders? Looking at page 50. Okay, a responsible attitude. Right, that's a part of it. Right. Most people have not decided, have not even thought about what the different principles are. Yet we shall give we give orders every day. Surely this is a pity. To know what principles may underlie any given activity of ours is to take a conscious attitude towards experience. As we mentioned, deciding responsible attitude and deciding which principles we're going to follow. So she starts giving some examples. Okay. Now behavioral patterns and obedience to orders. Hmm. You guys understand this so far? I'm at the bottom of page 51. Yes. What is she talking about, Tammy? Um, 51, the last two, par last two paragraphs on that page. The pe people, some people, just think it's just a matter of I tell you what to do and you do it. Right. What else? So sometimes that oh my god I'm sorry. Can I uh, add something? Yeah. Like what you're talking about, um, you have to appeal to like the habits of people. Yes. So, so actually, I read a book before, um, before I like uh, maybe like a year ago called Power of Habit, mm -hmm. and it was talking about how toothpaste it didn't have the mint flavor, but this guy put like the minty like tingling sensation, so people would associate brushing their teeth with that sensation. And that got them to sell a lot more toothpaste. Uh, this is a pretty interesting book. Yeah. Ah, it's built on that. So, first of all, she says you think you can just give an order and that's it. Wrong. You should also try to communicate with them intellectually. Try to convince them, again, that field of desire. And by you should tell a story that does a trick, right? Now, sometimes people <coughs> just aren't smart enough and they're just not going to figure it out, right? Because you also have to work with their habits. And you remember we talked about role playing with Jeff Jekyll? That's an example of those habits. People do things without thinking about them, and you have to break those habits, just like you talked about. That is a process of socialization, just like we saw in the Jeff Checkler article. To a lesser extent, the DiMaggio and Powell isomorphism article, too. Does that make sense, how that ties in? Let's see. Oh, uh, yes, the circumstances of orders. This is a good note for contemporary managers. Okay. So a couple things here, right? Do you think, um, so first of all, she talks about, you know, the orders will not take the place of training. You should always train people adequately, again, develop their habits, change their habits, because remember, you're in control until you act. So if you train people adequately, you don't have to act, you are in control. But something that I think is very important, right? We see that the place in which orders are given, the circumstances under which they're given, may make all the difference in the world as to the response we get. Hand them down a long way from the president or works manager, and the effect is weakened. One might say that the strength of the favorable response to an order is an inverse ratio to the distance the order travels. Production efficiency is always in danger of being affected whenever a long distance order is substituted for a face-to-face -face suggestion. Ms. Merlin, was that a hand up? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. So what lesson would you take away from that statement that you gave? It's better to have face-to-face -face communication because um, like nothing can replace like training a uh, subordinate as to what you want them to do. Part of it is 
also, you're right, part of it is the training. But I think a message that we should all take with us in our contemporary workplace, don't send that email. Get out of your chair, get out of the office, and go see the person and tell them. Well, and, and like she's saying, there's other circumstances that get in the way when you're not face to face with somebody. Because of body, the lack of body language, so you don't know exactly what tone you're sending out. Oh, and an email can be interpreted the wrong way. Because everyone has a different perspective on how they treat the content. So if you send out an email, bad news or whatever, they're obviously gonna get the, they're obviously gonna understand it in their own direction because there's no body language involved, there's no emotions involved. Well, so which could screw. And, and also an email to an employee may, may feel, if, it, if it's something important, may feel like it wasn't important enough for you to come talk to me about it. You just sent me an email. Yeah. I mean, I have a colleague at work, right? And she's like the nicest person you ever know. She should have a bad ball in her body. And so she sent an email to this person, and, she, and the person had a weird first name. She didn't know if it was a man or a woman. So she didn't, you, know, you can't say sir or ma'am if you don't know what, you know. And so she just wrote hello, comma. And, then, and it was a very nice email, just a very simple question about something with finance. And you know, this individual wrote back, all caps, you know, who do you think you are to hello me? <laughs> I mean, this person was furious. Wow. Right? Now, I bet you if she just got over and said, like, hello, and then asked the question, it probably would have been fine. Maybe good morning or good afternoon. Mm -hmm. yeah, some, some people think hello is actually too too informal, isn't that weird? Yeah, people are offended by hello. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're going to change working with that person, yeah. it would just make sense that if you didn't know if it was meant, well then go meet them for the first time. Oh yeah. yeah. That's true. Because by sending out the first email, they don't know how you, they don't know you. They probably think that you are telling them like they're doing a bad job. That's probably how you took it or he or she took it is that they did a bad job and that's why she was asking. Yeah, I must, I'm actually don't have that opportunity for the face-to-face -face with a lot of the people that I'm working with. But then a phone call would be the next best yeah, thing to an email. Or an introduction. Hey, it's uh, my name is so, so you know, some sort of form of introduction to where your first email is not asking something about their job. Because I think that's where it comes off offensive. Okay. I think sometimes it's also that in person you're more informal, but then when you send an email or a text message, yeah. it comes out a bit formal and then you think that, oh, the other person is just being really cold with me, so yeah. I think there might be something wrong, right. so, which creates, which leads to misunderstandings. So. One of the greatest things that I, there's many things about living in France that I don't miss, <laughs> <laughs> but there's one thing I do miss, and it took me a while to use it, they, they never put things in the right, they never do. And so if you want to figure out what's going on, you have to take you know, two or three times a day, a coffee or a cigarette break, or both. You know, both coffee and cigarettes at the same time, I mean. And you sit around you, and you talk to people. And you go to their office and say, hey, I need this. Or, hey, you know, like, with my advisor, I rarely emailed him unless it was very important. And he knew that the email would probably be kind of long. But it was, it was all important stuff. Otherwise, I'd just say, can I make an appointment to see you? Sometimes he just wouldn't be there for a month or something. But, Do you yeah. think it's still like that now, though? Because I feel like... It wasn't like, even two years ago. Oh, just two years yeah. ago. Okay. Because for some reason, I feel like a lot of people are more now into email. Here in the U.S., yeah. Okay. I was talking about when I was living in France. That's what okay, I Okay, so France is yeah. the same thing. They, they're, they'd they're, rather be more face-to-face. Yeah. -face. yeah, they'll see you. That, and, that's because I, I'm yeah. using email because I have to document a conversation mm -hmm. or that I'm tracking somebody's response. So I, you know, so that's my main purpose for email is I have to hold somebody you have accountable. Evidence. Yeah. I like it better too because you just have like a trail of everything. No, I didn't mess up. You per your email, here I it agree. is. <laughs> but when the culture doesn't allow the for that. The culture is different, you, yeah. You do things differently and someone's word holds a lot of weight. Yeah, you just need that one time where you can't prove something. Mm -hmm. I know that's where it <laughs> that's where you that's mess right. up. So I like Mary Parker Paul's little comment on email, even though she died long before there was email. <laughs> <laughs> there were letters. What's that? There were letters handwritten. Yeah, that's true. And she mentioned just like when the factory boss hands it down, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about too many and too few orders. We kind of talked about this. A little bit already. You know, depersonalizing orders, obeying the laws of the situation, I guess you might say it's 58 or something. 
You guys see that heading? Mm -hmm. Depersonalizing, depersonalizing orders, obeying yeah. the laws of the situation. Okay. Now, what is our problem here? How can we avoid two extremes? Too great bossism, that's a great word, in giving orders, and practically, practically no orders given. I'm going to ask you how you are avoiding these extremes. My solution is to depersonalize orders, to unite all concerned in the study of the situation, to discover the law of the situation, and obey that. Until we do this, I do not think we have the most successful business administration. This is what does take place. This is what has to take place when there is a question between two men in positions of equal authority. And then she kind of goes down a little bit. Uh, both have to agree to take their orders from the situation. What is she saying? Let me give you an example. I used to use this all the time in the Army. The Army, oh, let me give an even more extreme example. When I was a cadet before I even commissioned, right? You guys know what cadets are? That's like officers in training. And so a lot of cadet leadership is, is peer leadership, right? So you're put in a position of authority just for, this is how they do the leadership training, like, hey, I'm the platoon leader right now. And then when the end of this exercise is over, like an hour later, I'm no longer the platoon leader. And so you know, you're in charge for a very short time, and it's hard to get people that you drink with and all this other stuff when you're not in ROTC to listen to you, right? So what do you do? How do you depersonalize the order? Okay, there's two ways you do it. One, my battalion commander when I was a cadet was just, it wasn't good, okay? I'm not gonna say what it was, but it wasn't good, right? And so a nickname for colonels in the army is the old man. They're actually not old, it's just a term, right? He was only 42 or something, so it wasn't old. And so we'd say, hey, you need to do this, or the old man's going to find out. Depersonalize. I'm not telling you to do this. I'm putting the fear of God in you because when the old man comes down, it's going to be ugly for all of us, you included. So you better help me do that, right? And that's how you get people to get out in the rain and sludge through all this nonsense when they'd really be hiding in a tent sleeping. Okay. Maybe another example from, a, from cadet time. Instead of me saying, hey, Cindy, you're going to do this, I'd say, well, the regulation says that when you, incur, you know, encounter these circumstances, this is, how you should, uh, this is how we react. Would you help me get this done and we can work together based on the parameters of this regulation? And so the regulation kind of gives you a nice abbreviation of this kind of <coughs> law of the situation. And we, we pitch it as, we both need to get there. Let's get there together. Can you help me? You see how this depersonalized? I'm not giving you an order. The situation dictates it, and we're just going to get there together. But, you know, cadet life is an extreme example, but you can still find this in, in real life. You work at H&M, right? Yeah. If you're at H&M and a drunk customer pitches all the clothes onto the floor, yeah. right? Do you want to say, you know, hey, you clean up the vomit and the clothes and, you know, or else because I'm a supervisor? <laughs> no. You'd probably say when the store manager comes, we're going to be in a lot of trouble if it looks like this. Would you mind giving me a hand? Even I'll clean up some of the vomit too, and we'll just we'll just get it done so the store manager doesn't fire us. But do you see how you depersonalize it? Hey, we got a problem. Can you help me? Does this make sense? Now she gives a little bit of a foreshadowing to another book we're going to read in this course, Principles of Scientific Management, and she talks about scientific management tends to depersonalize orders. I'm still on page 15. Managers are as much under orders as our workers. And that was a big that was a big deal with Taylor, right? Taylor followed workers around with a stopwatch. And he said, this is the absolute best way to turn a bolt into a piece of metal. This is exactly how you shovel coal into a thing because this is the most efficient way. I've timed it and I've measured it. I'm not telling you what to do, but together you, the worker, and me, the scientific manager, have said this is the most efficient way based on your abilities and what I have designed for you. This is the best way to do it. And I call it depersonalizing because there is not time to go further in the matter. What I really think is a matter of repersonalizing. We persons have relations with each other, and then she skips down a little bit. This divorcing of persons and the situation does a great deal of harm. Huh. I have just said that scientific management depersonalizes. The deeper philosophy of scientific magic shows us personal relations within the whole setting of that thing of which they are part. 
What is she saying? What does that even mean? It's confusing, isn't it? Well, some of the some of the relationships you have are with family, and some of them are with work. So you need to be sure that the way you're dealing with that person matches the environment that you're in. That's part of it. So that's part of repersonalizing. And another part is also not so much just saying that the situation dictates it, but emphasizing that we're going to get there together. Does that make sense? So as a team and as a friend, we're going to get there together. Okay, so you're repersonalizing. There is a relationship going on between us, and that relationship helps us get there faster. Work as a team. Exactly. To get the job done. But a team with no leader. Mm -hmm. The situation is the leader. So far, so good? Let me ask you this. So right now, it's about 8 o'clock. Do you want to go through a little more, or do you want to do your break now? It's up to you. I wouldn't turn around for the difference. Do we leave early or what? Um, that's up to you. <laughs> I mean, it's up to you. I don't know. What do you guys? Do you guys need a break? Yes. Okay. So let's do this. Let's. Is it is a ten minute break sufficient? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's do a ten minute break. We'll come back and we'll do a little bit more. Mary Parker followed.